Howdy folks, I'm your host Aaron Heath. I take a moment and thank you for downloading, subscribing, and most importantly, listening to this odd-sounding episode number 75 of the Gun Rights in Texas podcast. You can find the show notes by going to gunrightsintexas.com slash 075. Now, I am sounding different because I am trying out a different configuration for recording. Basically, I took all the gold chain out of the recording studio. Right now, I'm just using my Zoom H6, my boom mic, which I do need to adjust. Sorry about that. And the tablet I use is a soundboard. And that's all that we're using here, or all that I'm using. Mainly because I'm going to set up a similar uh, portable setup for use on my in my pickup. A little over a month ago, I bought a pickup. The beauty of that is, unlike my Jeep, it has good sound characteristics inside the cab. My Jeep, not so much. Especially when you consider the Jeep is currently configured with a soft top and soft doors. Sound quality in it is not all that good. But enough of that. I'll go into more detail on that in a moment. However, right now, we have a carry tip. Now, I know everybody says a modern gun shouldn't need a break-in period, and they're right. The gun shouldn't. However, it is still a good idea to do a break-in session with a new gun before carrying it. I don't care if the new gun is a brand new gun or a new-to-you gun. The reason is it allows you to test the firearm to ensure it functions as you expect it to. It also provides you a chance to stress test the firearm. This means you can do rapid fire, emptying a magazine, rapidly changing magazines, and things like that. Now as I go along, I am adjusting the, uh, the properties of the Zoom mixer as well. Or not mixer, but the Zoom uh, recorder. Now another reason you should do a break-in session with the firearm is, and this is probably the most important, is that it allows you to become familiar with the firearm, its operation, and how it reacts to you using it. Or how it reacts to being fired. Now you may say, well, you know, it's going to have recoil. Yeah, but how much recoil, how does it feel under that recoil, it don't matter. If you have fired 15 similar firearms, you have not fired that one. And this firearm may have its own unique characteristics. Now, another thing that you may seriously consider is that it lets you determine what ammunition the firearm likes and does not like. This is important because if the firearm does not like a particular type of ammunition, it won't feed it. And that's what we mean when we say it doesn't like a type of ammunition. Okay, enough of that rambling. You know what? Let's go ahead and hit the audio clip that tells you how to get the show. Even though you have somehow found it, you're listening to it. But you may not be entirely clear on how to get it, so let's hit the audio clip that tells you how to do that. And then I will come back and we'll talk a little bit about why I am experimenting with recording equipment so that I can do this in the cab of my pickup. The Gun Rights in Texas podcast is available on iTunes, on Stitcher, on Myro Player, YouTube, the website, and of course, in your favorite app using the RSS feed on the website. With all those options, there is no excuse for not subscribing. Links to all these can be found on every page of the website. Now you may have heard the mic click just before and just after the or just at the start of the music and then just at the end of the music on telling you how to get the show. That's because the I do not have the ability to mute individual tracks without playing with volume knobs. Once I get the volume knobs dialed in for this, I want to record where they go. And at that point, it's going to be a case of do not touch it unless it's being hooked up to the mixer. And then it gets adjusted right back to where it was. Anyhow, back to why I'm doing this. <sighs> Some people may dislike the idea. Some people may think it's a great idea. The problem is, I'm not getting enough episodes out to keep myself and a lot of listeners happy. This two-week ske- two uh, schedule between episodes, that's not working for me. And we're coming up on a point when we're going to start seeing a lot of information popping up. We're going to see a lot of news. We're going to see a lot of commentary needing to be made. So we got to do something. We have to get this information 
and we have to be ready to get episodes out maybe maybe uh multiple episodes a week and in order to do that i need to be able to record at a time when i'm not really doing that much more and i spend 15 to 20 minutes a day on the highway driving at speed now this may not seem like much time but i am not exactly planning to produce an episode that's going to be crystal clear clean and a hundred percent ready to be used it's going to be a short mini episode and these may be a these may be something we do every could be done every day it could be done every week it may not be done at all but i want to experiment i want to see if it's feasible and i want to know is this something people are interested in and that's why basically it's my way of experimenting to see if we can do new episodes more frequently. With that said, I want to run the audio clip that tells you how to find the show on social media. After that, well, we're going to hit the topic. The Gun Rights in Texas podcast has a social media presence. You can like it on Facebook. You can follow it on Twitter. You can circle it on Google+. Plus. And you can follow it on Instagram. With all those options, let's get social. And we're back. What are we back to? I don't know. That's up to you. No, I'm kidding. We're back to talking about private gun sales and purchases. After the show, I'm going to have a rather extended uh, comment section or not comment, but commentary. So stick around for that. However, I have received requests on a mul- from an, uh, on multiple occasions from a number of different people where they're asking about what are the laws in Texas on private gun transactions. And I know you're probably hearing me breathe a little bit more than normal. That's because I do not normally have my mic positioned the way that I, it is right now. Normally, my mic is positioned offside from my face. And because I am trying to experiment with how it might be placed in my pickup, it's positioned entirely differently. Now, while Texas may have no laws regarding the private sale and purchase of firearms directly, there are a few laws in Texas that do affect the process. The first thing we're going to talk about is, for federally firearms licensed dealers, these are gun stores that sell guns to the public, also known as FFLs, they have to follow all federal laws and regulations. For the most part, we do too. There are a few laws and regulations in regards to firearms that we don't have to follow because we don't have an FFL. And that doesn't exactly make things easier. It makes things more complicated for those who want to obey the law. You know, the real matter, the truth of the matter is, if it's not prohibited, it's legal. So let's take a look at some prohibitions. Under federal law, transfers to or from someone that's out of state have to go through an FFL. Now, I am just a few miles from the state line. And by state line, I mean the New Mexico state line. Let's say I have a friend that lives... Excuse me. I did not anticipate yawning there. Let's say I have a friend that lives across the state line. In fact, let's say my friend theoretically lives on a road that runs parallel to the state line, and his house is just yards away from the state of Texas. And let's say I live a few yards on exactly the other side of the state line in Texas. Now, you may be wondering, why am I bringing up this particular scenario? Let's say we live at most 10 yards away from each other, and I've got a pistol and I'm firing it at a range nearby, which there really isn't one nearby to the location I'm imagining, but let's pretend that there is since we're in pretend land. He comes over, he sees me shooting, and he wants to buy that gun. Now, we're both going to have to drive into his state where he has an FFL. I will turn the gun over to that dealer who will log it into inventory, and then he will purchase that weapon from me through the dealer, or with the dealer doing the background check. He will pay the dealer a fee for doing the background check and processing the 40, 
<clears throat> excuse me, the 4473. This comes to be a bit of a problem. Why should we drive who knows how far? Maybe it's just a couple of miles. Maybe it's 10 or 15 miles into town in his state to pay, to do a transfer. I mean, we only live 10 yards apart. Well, I don't live that close to the state line, but that's how it would have to be done if I did. And my neighbor wanted to buy a gun that I had. Well, my neighbor that just happens to live on the other side of the state line. The reason that it's done this way, the federal government views transfers that cross the state line as interstate commerce, and they want to regulate that interstate commerce. Now, when you go through a federal firearms licensed dealer, the minimum age for a sale by an FFL does apply because it's a private sale going to a minor under, or not a minor, but someone that's under 21 does not mean the FFL can let you take possession of that weapon or let them take possession of that weapon. They have to be at least 21 for a handgun, at least 18 for a long gun. Now, under, under non-FFL transactions that take place in state, there's no need for an FFL to be involved, and the minimum age is determined by state law. Now, fed, federal background checks do not apply, and felons, as well as other prohibited persons, cannot buy or sell. Also, you cannot buy or sell to them or with them. Buy from them or sell to them. Let's put it that way. Now, Texas Penal Code Section 46.04, which is the unlawful possession of a firearm, says that people convicted of a felony cannot legally own or possess a firearm within five years after release from confinement and or supervision. Actually, it's not so much own as it is possess. Or after five years if possessed at a location other than where the person lives. So under state law, a felon after five years after they've completed their confinement and or supervision, whichever comes last, can legally possess and own a firearm where they live under state law. Federal law, they're still prohibited. Now, someone convicted of domestic violence, a Class A misdemeanor, is also prohibited from owning a firearm or possess, actually possessing a firearm within five years after release from confinement and or supervision. Now, you're also prohibited from possessing a firearm if you're under a restraining order that is in effect. And that's Texas law. Now, someone that's under the age of 17, uh, there's nothing keeping them from owning it, but, and there's nothing keeping them from possessing it, actually. However, Texas Penal Code Section 46.13 does make it an offense if you make a firearm available to a minor or to a child. And for all intents and purposes, 46.13 has a definition of a child that means a person younger than 17 years of age. <sighs> now let's talk about some best practices. It's probably a good idea, and I don't have these wrote down in the show notes, but it's probably a good idea if you are selling a firearm to document just a little bit as to who is taking possession of it. It's also a good idea to make sure that you get a driver's license or at least see one to make sure that they're a legal Texas resident. And it's usually a good idea to ask a few questions about them, namely questions like, well, uh, are you legal to own a firearm? Do you have any felony convictions? Have you ever been convicted of a of the misdemeanor for uh, domestic violence against a family member? Things like that. And when you know that, then you know if you could legally sell them their firearm. Excuse me, I've been up a little, a little more than I need to be. I'm yawning, I'm fighting off sleep, I'm having all kinds of problems staying focused here, so please excuse me. Now, if you, for some reason, you're not comfortable selling them the firearm immediately, but you want to go ahead and proceed with the deal, as long as they meet the requirements for federal law, as far as age and residency, take it to an FFL. Maybe you even want to, maybe you'll even want to, I don't know, pay the transfer fee for them. After all, you're getting a sizable chunk of their money. Might not be a bad idea to say, well, I'm not entirely comfortable with this. Let's take it to an FFL. And their reaction may change your, their reaction may change your mind about being uncomfortable or it may solidify it. 
But if you go to an FFL, your hands are washed. It's now the federal government and possibly the dealer that's going to be at fault. Consider that as an option. And those are my best practices. I do have a few other practices I like to do when I buy a used firearm. Now, the state of Florida has the database online where you can run serial numbers and see if they're stolen. My understanding is that database is officially for the state of Florida. Unofficially, I have heard that it does tap into NCIC. So when you run that firearm serial number, it may get run through NCIC, which is the federal database. I don't know that for a fact. I've heard this rumor, but who knows? Moving on, I think it's time to just simply hit the hit the audio that tells us how to get in touch with me, and then we'll move back to talking about the news. If you want to contact the podcast, please send email to Aaron at gunrightsintexas.com, or you can leave a comment on the webpage, which is gunrightsintexas.com. However, if you want to leave a voicemail and be featured on the show, then please do so by dialing 409-292-6736. Well, I'm, I'm bringing this, next, this first story up. It's in the politics category. I'm bringing it up because I received this from what Open Carry Texas would call my spies, in their news groups. <laughs> this story was sent to me by someone where OCT was talking about they they were being painted to look wrong, uh, look like they were, uh, where they were being considered, or they were being found guilty of guilt by association. So, is it guilt by association, or is it just associating one cause with another when they shouldn't be associated together? The organizer for a Confederate flag rally has told participants to bring rifles and extra magazines just in case. Lamar Russell, who is also a member of the San Antonio chapter of Open Carry, Texas, has said said that he expects a dozen or so people to show up. I believe this rally has already taken place. He also indicated he wants to show Southern pride in the Confederate flag are not racist. Now, Open Carry, Texas is claiming that people are using this these two things being associated together through Lamar Russell. Well, because Lamar Russell's associated with both, and he's trying to bring people from both groups to the event, the media is reportedly trying to associate Open Carry Texas with racism. Well, in full disclosure, I have had a number of issues with Open Carry Texas. I won't deny it. In fact, I won't even, uh, I won't even try to sugarcoat it. I really don't like their leader and I really don't like them. Mostly because of how they act and how they have made things more difficult and the straight up mistruths and half-truths that they have put out there. However, in their defense, I have yet to see anything from Open Carry Texas that is overtly racist or even covertly racist. Everything I have seen from Open Carry Texas shows that they really don't care about race at all. And that's important. You see? (sighs) I'm trying to think of the best way to put it. When Open Carry Texas went to the Fifth Ward, they were were, uh, met. Let's call it that. They were met by Black Panthers who were also openly carrying rifles. The people that were confronted did respond But from what I understand, race was not brought up in that. Open Carry Texas has, you know, throughout their uh, videos, made it a point. Every time they have an encounter, they throw video up. And a lot of these videos, you see a lot of mixed race in Open Carry Texas. You see people that are of Hispanic descent. You have seen people that are of African descent. You have seen people of Oriental descent in their videos there's not really anything that I can point to and say that makes open carry Texas racist. I assure you, if they were running around with swastikas and shaving their heads and doing all kinds of crazy racially challenged stuff, yeah, I'd call them out on it. But they really don't, uh, they really don't have 
anything to point to. Moving on, Houston, Texas recently hosted a discussion on the open carry law that will take effect on January 1st, 2016. According to the Houston Chronicle, 200 people showed up, and the discussion, or discussion, good lord, the discussion was hosted by the Houston Police Chief, the Harris County District Attorney, and the Houston City Attorney. I watched the video, I think it's linked in the article. It was pretty good. It was a pretty good discussion. Now, there was a guy really pushing Texas Shield Law, which I think he meant Texas Law Shield, but he was really pushing it, even though he's just a uh, client. And Texas Law Shield was there. They kind of commented on it. And Terry Holcomb was there, and he commented on it. But you'll find a lot of information in regards to how these people are really looking to have, well, how these people are looking to have it enforced. And that's what we're going to leave it at. Also in the politics, good Lord, I got I got someone, uh, we'll refer to her as Stacy because I don't know if she wants me to give her name on the show, but Stacy has given me, or Stacy asked if I needed help coming up with news stories, and she's kind of worked the news segment over for me. And she's got like five stories in here instead of our typical three, and they're all in the political category. Thank you, Stacy. You know who you are, and we'll call, continue to call you Stacy unless you want me to use your real name in the podcast. Our next one is coming to us from Ballotopedia, and according to Ballotopedia, Proposition Te- 6, the Texas Right to Hunt and Fish Constitutional Amendment passed with an 81% majority of the voting public voting for it. Well, folks, so much for not wanting open carry or not well, open carry, but so much for not wanting to pass any gun control bills if 81% of the voting public voted for this. Our next story, TCU, a private university, has chosen to opt out of the campus carry law that was recently passed by the Texas legislature and signed by the governor. Campus carry will go into effect on September 1st of 2016 for the most part. And there already is a number of major efforts to keep it from being effective. Stacy does things a little differently than I do, but I think I think with her help, it'll improve the news segment. I really do think so. But I'm going to talk to her. I think we're going to talk about limiting this to three, especially when I give a massive monologue on the first one. Speaking of the first one, it's always good to reach the last one, which is number five in this case. The group Te- Gun Owners of America has filed a lawsuit. Actually, I think they they have appealed a lawsuit that they may have filed. But this lawsuit is currently in the appeals court for the Federal Fifth Circuit in an effort to challenge the legality of the post-86 ban on new machine guns for civilian ownership. Yay. I don't know if it'll go anywhere, but oh well. Be interesting to see where they take it. The thing is, the Heller decision, a lot of the questions were about if they found there was a individual right to keep own to keep and bear arms, would it would it mean that everybody could own machine guns? And a lot of people thought the Second Amendment Foundation and their attorney threw threw machine gun owners or machine gun ownership under the bus because they said no, not at this time. If it had answered any other way it would have seriously jeopardized the case. The justices that were there just did not find the idea of machine gun ownership to be comfortable. And now the court has even more liberal members. I don't know about you, but this is a scary, scary thought. I really, I really like the idea of getting a court case that says one way or the other, if the ownership of machine guns is pre- is protected constitutionally, but at the same time, I'm not exactly certain we want to take the risk of them saying no, it's not. But hey, with that said, I'm going to hit the, I want to hit the music to end the show, and then I'll come back with my monologue or my commentary at the end. So please stick around, and you can probably guess what it's going to be about. But even if you can't, stick around and. Or even if you can, stick around, we'll we'll touch on it when we come back. Thank you for listening to the Gun Rights in Texas podcast. 
please leave a review on iTunes or send feedback to the host. Your input will be used to improve the show. Stay safe and please carry responsibly. Well, turning the microphone back on on that one sounded a little coordinated with the music. Or at least from where I'm at, it did. I don't know. Well, I don't like talking about major news events that we don't have all the details on before we have the details. However, I'm going to make a little bit of an exception. Europe has some of the strictest gun control laws out there. Private ownership of arms is practically illegal in Europe. And even where it's legal, it's heavily regulated. And the ability to carry firearms for your self-defense purposes and for the defensive purposes in regards to others is extremely regulated to the point of there not being any such right. There's no process even and then you have these extremists they show up they want to kill anybody that doesn't believe in their version of god because well they want to convert people to god or to their version of god which doesn't make sense if you kill everybody off you're not going to convert anyone if you don't actually have if you don't actually have the chance to give them an opportunity to convert? Are you not destroying your chances of making your God happy? I'm a Christian, and God, as I believe in him, doesn't want us going out there and killing people. In fact, he kind of put that into a commandment that says, Thou shalt not murder. Hmm. I don't know about you, but I think there's a problem there. Now, the reason I bring this up, it turns out some, maybe a significant majority, we don't know yet, but at least one, probably more of these terrorists that perpetrated this horrendous act came in as refugees from Syria. Syria is the same place that we are attempting to import refugees from here into the United States. Now, some people say, well, if you watch the presidential debates, uh, in the Democratic Party, you'll understand that we're going to vet these people because even the president has said we're going to vet them very well. And I don't buy that. How are you going to vet these people when their own government, what little there is of it, doesn't even know who is and is not safe to have in their organization? How are you going to know if... These people are terrorists when they flee a place that basically because of tons of strife and civil war does not have any kind of record saying, hey, these people may have tendencies to commit these crimes. These people have committed these crimes. Though These people have committed those crimes. And these people haven't done a dang thing. How are you going to be able to research that? when there is no records. And then we want to bring people from the same part of the world who are fleeing from that same country for the same reasons as the people that were fleeing from, uh, that were fleeing from that part of the world, from that country, into Europe, and some of them just happened to be terrorists and launched, or participated in this massive attack. I have heard these people have been there less than a month, maybe a little over a month, but they've been there about a month. You do not just simply join a group and go kill a bunch of people in roughly a month. An attack of this nature is extremely well planned. It is highly coordinated. Everybody that participates in this group is known to be members of the group for some time, even though 
They may be in Syria for a while, or maybe they are in Pakistan, or maybe they're in France, or maybe they're in Germany. Who knows? But they show up, and within a month, they're part of a group that's killing people in a very well-planned, well-coordinated, and well-organized attack. You have to ask yourself, did they bring in required intelligence? Did they bring in the required orders? Or were they the leadership that was that the people that carried out the attack were waiting on? And now you want to import these same people into the U.S. I think uh, the numbers that I've been hearing is that we got a few thousand here already and that they want to bring in as many as 65,000. I don't know. This just seems like a bad idea. <laughs> this seems like a really bad idea to me. However, those of us who have a Texas concealed handgun license or a license from another state, or maybe we have the new license to carry from Texas, whatever it is that our license says and wherever it's from, we have a duty to be ready to deal with this. We have a duty to be ready to defend ourselves throughout our daily lives. We have a duty to avoid places that would tell us it is better for us to be a victim and not harm their, the attackers that might attack us on their property because they don't want their attackers harmed. They might sue. We need to avoid places like that. And we need to go places where they don't care. And we need to do it in a way where we don't force these places to care enough to decide that they don't want to support us. We need to convince these places that they need our business and that they need our business to the point that they don't care if we are armed and able to defend ourselves or that they appreciate that we are armed and able to defend ourselves. Standing there and throwing out Mimi posters because, you know, some place said, well, we don't want you bringing our guns here. And now every time there's a robbery, you're going to throw out a poster or, you know, make comments and close groups that eventually do get back to these places. It's not a good idea to really push these places like that because you're not convincing them of anything. No, what you're doing is you're showing them that you're an ass. Instead of doing that, how about just simply not going there? And when you go to their competitor, save up your receipts. And maybe once a month or once a year or once a week, depending on how often you go there, take your receipts, add up a total, and then mail it to that business that does not want your money and tell them. This is what I spent at your competitor because you are you do not want me armed at your business. Don't be rude, don't be smug, don't be snide, don't be over here making these comments that it's you know better to be judged by 12 than carried by 6 when you're talking when you're um talking about going to that business. No. Convince them that they need you and they need your money. And that they need you and your money enough that they don't care if you're armed. That's what you need to do. Now, the governor has said that he's not going to allow any refugees to come into Texas or any new refugees to come into Texas. However, I don't know how I don't know how legal that is, and I don't know if it'll hold any water. This is for people that are smarter than me to decide. And by smarter than me, I mean smarter than me on this subject. You're smarter than everybody that you're going to encounter on some subject. It may be a small subject. It may be a major subject. This is a subject I have no knowledge in, and I don't really know, and I don't care to know. All I know is I think it should be one way, and we need to help. We need to work on getting it there. But you know what? That's enough of my ramblings on the Paris attacks where we go where I go from the Paris attacks to the to my my rant about uh, gun signs, and we're going to wrap the episode up there. So please stay safe and carry responsibly.